Panpsychism. Panpsychism. Tell me more. Well, we've spent several decades now. Pan what's the motivation for panpsychism? I think we've spent several decades now trying to explain consciousness in terms of completely non-conscious processes in the brain. And in my view, we've got precisely nowhere with that project. And so what the panpsychist proposes is we, we try and explain complex forms of consciousness in the human or animal brain in terms of simpler forms of consciousness, where those simple forms of consciousness are then postulated to exist as, as basic features of matter, perhaps basic properties of fundamental particles. So it feels a bit wacky and new age, but you know I think we should judge a view by its not by its cultural connotations, but by its explanatory power. And I think the, the attraction of panpsychism is it, it gives us a way of integrating consciousness into our scientific picture of the world, and in a way that avoids the deep difficulties uh, that plague the other options, such as materialism or dualism. So I think that in itself gives us, at the very least, strong reason to take this view very seriously indeed. Can you talk more about the, um, the fallacies of materialism? And fallacies dualism, of materialism. Though? One is the fact that physical science works with a, a purely quantitative vocabulary, whereas consciousness is an essentially qualitative phenomenon, simply in the sense that it involves qualities. So if you think about the redness of a red experience, or the sweet smell of flowers, or the taste of coffee, you simply can't capture these kind of qualities in the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science. And indeed, this was well understood by the, the founder of physical science, Galileo. So Galileo only intended physical science to be a partial description of reality. He hoped that it could capture the, the, the mathematical features of reality, but he never dreamt that it could capture the qualities of consciousness, which he, took, he believed resided in the soul. So, so a lot of people have this argument, oh, you know, physical science has done so well. You know, this ought to give us great confidence that it'll one day solve the problem of consciousness. But my response is, no, well, no, physical science has done so well since specifically because it was never designed to deal with consciousness. So from the very start, Galileo kicks things off by taking consciousness outside of the domain of scientific inquiry and thereby giving physical scientists a more manageable task. So I think that's the... I mean, an another way of looking at the difficulty is the clash between the, the subjective and the objective. So I think physical science tries to give a completely objective description of reality. As I say, a description of reality that could be grasped by anyone, no matter what your life experience. So there might, you know, there might be aliens who visit us from another planet and they have very different sensory organs and very different kind of experience of the world. And maybe they couldn't understand our music or our art because of that. But if they're intelligent enough to understand mathematics, they could get our physics. So that's, that's what we try to give a completely, as Thomas Nagel put it, physics tries to get the view from nowhere. Whereas consciousness is an essentially subjective phenomenon. So you, you can only understand someone's consciousness if you can take on their perspective. So a blind neuroscientist, no matter how much they know about what's going on in the brain when someone sees colours, they'll never know what it's like to see colour because they can't adopt the perspective of a sighted person. Or to use a famous example again from Thomas Nagel, no matter how much we know about the neurophysiology of bats, we'll never know what it's like to be a bat because we can't take on the perspective of a creature that echolocates their way around the world. So I think, I mean, I think at the end of the day, materialism always ends up inevitably just denying the existence of consciousness, arguing that, you know, there aren't really these kind of subjective qualities. There are really just the objective, quantitative properties of physical science. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's really, really the problem with materialism, I think. Um, turning to dualism, so I, th so I take dualism to be the view that um, consciousness is a property of the immaterial soul outside of the physical workings of the body and brain. Uh, fortunately, this view is hopeless too. So I think we now have... Um, I mean, I think the problem is, if there was an immaterial soul interacting with the brain every second of waking life, you know, sending signals to raise our arms and move our lips, that would certainly show up in our neuroscience. Right? There would be all sorts of things happening in the brain that had no physical cause. It would be like a poltergeist was playing with the brain. And we just, we just don't find that. So I think neuroscience gives us a strong and ever-growing case that uh, consciousness is, is located in the brain rather than the soul. So, so this is a problem, right? So when I studied philosophy in the dying embers of the 20th century, we were taught that 
there are two options on consciousness, right? Either you think physical science can explain it, in which case you're a materialist, or, uh, or, or you think it's non-physical, in which case you're a dualist. And I think philosophers have come to see that, you know, both of these options are pretty hopeless. And so, you know, more and more in the past five, ten years, I'd say more and more philosophers and some neuroscientists are turning to panpsychism as our best hope for making progress on consciousness. What's the strongest argument against panpsychism? What's the thing that you run up against most? Uh, the weakest argument, and then I'll get to the strongest argument, uh, I think the weakest argument against panpsychism is, which is probably the most common, is, oh, it's just weird. It's just kind of too weird to think that particles have consciousness, or, or it's, it's, it's got a kind of new age feel to it. But I mean, I just think this really isn't a serious objection. You know, plenty of our best scientific theories are wildly counter to common sense, the view that time slows down when you travel faster, the view that particles can be in an indeterminate between two locations. But um, I, I think probably what is generally agreed to be the, the strongest argument is the so-called against panpsychism. What is generally taken to be the strongest argument against panpsychism is the so-called combination problem. So this is the difficulty of how we get from little conscious things like particles uh, to big conscious things like brains. So this is a very serious problem. And there's a lot of energy currently being expended to try and make progress on this. There are people exploring integration of information, people trying to rethink the nature of spatial relationships or part-whole relationships. Some people... Two think... minutes. Sorry, keep me. Okay, uh, maybe I'll go back a bit. So there, there are people uh, thinking about the integration of information, people thinking about whether we can rethink the nature of spatial relationships or part-whole relationships. People thinking whether we can think of this as uh, a more general aspect of the problem of the unity of consciousness. Um, so I think you know, there's lots of very interesting ideas and there's, there's real hope that we can make progress on this. Um, so it's not, it's not that panpsychism offers us a complete finished theory of consciousness. You know, I think it's, it's still very early days in, in the science of consciousness. But to my mind, the problems faced by the panpsychist look to be much more tractable than the problems faced by either the materialist or the dualist. Um, so it looks to me just like just looks like a more promising research program, and um, and you know it doesn't have to be either or. You know sometimes materialists talk as if we shouldn't be doing anything else but trying to get a materialist solution of consciousness, and everyone else is you know holding back scientific progress. But you know we can let a thousand flowers bloom, and you know and uh, you know see what happens, see what see what can be worked out. Well, what is consciousness? Well, I mean, it's a vast question. I think consciousness is the realm of possibility. And you can't know about possibilities unless they're in a conscious space. I think minds are containers of possibility. Possibilities are not physical facts. They're just possibilities, and they can only exist in something like an imagination. Um, so um, I think our conscious minds are, you know, that's what they do, they're to do with choices among possibilities. Our unconscious minds are about habits, things that we just do automatically, we don't need to think about them. And I think all minds really are spaces of possibility, even the mind underlying the cosmos. So I, I think, think of minds in general as conscious spaces or realms or containers of possibility. Are you not on the road there to panpsychism? What, what do you think of you know panpsychism? With there's some panpsychists here. What, what, what do you think? Oh, I'm pro panpsychism. I just think most panpsychists don't go far enough. Um, most panpsychists talk about the consciousness or minds of electrons or protons or and, and atoms and things like that, um, which is fine. The reason they do that is because they're trying to explain how we come to be conscious. Um, standard materialism is the doctrine that matter's unconscious, the whole universe is unconscious. And then they have the problem, okay, well if everything's unconscious and everything's made of matter, including our brains, how come we're conscious? So then they have to say, well, the consciousness somehow emerges out of complex arrangements, but how can something totally different from unconscious matter emerge? That's called the hard problem in the philosophy of mind. So to get out of that, some panpsychists, uh, some materialists have become panpsychists by saying, okay, well, let's have a little bit of consciousness in electrons and atoms and things. So uh, consciousness can emerge from something that has a much, much lower grade of mind or consciousness, 
even in subatomic particles. Um, and therefore we can overcome the problem of how something different in... Uh, it's, it's a difference of degree, not a difference in kind, um, the emergence of consciousness in human brains. So I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But the question I then asked them is, well, what about the sun? The sun is a self-organizing system. Uh, what does the sun think about? What's the mind of the sun like? I'm personally, I think the sun's conscious and indeed the entire galaxy and the whole universe. So um, I'm in favor of panpsychism, but pan means everywhere. Psyche means mind. Uh, I'm in favor of panpsychism. I just think it's so... Uh, uh, much too limiting to confine it to the realm of subatomic physics. So consciousness is not an emergent property of, of material? It's... Well, emergent property, I mean, what does it mean? It means that something comes from something that wasn't there before. It's a way of conjuring something out of, like a rabbit out of a hat. Um, you see, there are, there, there are three main ways of thinking about it. One is top-down. The whole universe is conscious, and um, even before there was any matter, there was consciousness or mind. And um, the evolution of matter in the universe is the, con the universe uh, has lower and lower levels of consciousness as it evolves. The Big Bang, the entire universe is one system, one mind, as it were. Then the fields of physics and things separate out, and stars and galaxies and whatnot. So, uh, then you have the emergence of many forms of consciousness, and then on life, uh, life on Earth you have, uh, I dare say in biology, there is an emergence of higher forms of consciousness. I mean, we have more than a worm or a bacterium. So in that area, in, 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 then you could say that there is a kind of emergence. But the top-down consciousness means you start with consciousness and it goes down from above, as it were. The bottom-up materialist theory is you start from subatomic particles and atoms and you work your way up and then you have to say well it emerges but you could just as well say it descends uh, the third position is to say well it's both uh, there's a sense in which there's a um, an emergence or an appearance of higher levels of complexity with more complexity but it's not that it was not there before um, I mean, after all our evolution has happened within on the planet earth within a galaxy, and what if the whole galaxy and what if the whole solar system are conscious, and what if Gaia, the Earth, is conscious, then our consciousness has appeared within much larger conscious systems. So, you know, these are philosophically different ways of looking at it. There's a prejudice in modern science in favour of materialism and reductionism and bottom-up explanations, but that's really a f kind of philosophical fashion, it's not the truth. How long has it been the fashion and how much further do you think it's, it's, gonna, it's going to be the fashion? Well, it's been the fashion since the late 19th century. Science became dominated by materialism in the late 19th century. And in many ways our views of matter have changed since then. They had an old classical physics view of matter as little atoms, as little billiard balls. Uh, quantum theory changes that very radically. Um, and they didn't know about the galaxies beyond our own, or the Big Bang, or modern cosmology. So uh, all these things have changed, but the philosophy of materialism is sort of locked in a 19th century worldview. And, um, of course, you can have an updated materialism, and in a sense, panpsychists are trying to update materialism, but as soon as you admit psyche or mind into matter, then it's not really materialism, it's really a form of animism. Animism is the belief that the whole of nature is alive and the whole universe is like an organism, not a machine. I think that's a much more reasonable view myself. So what we're at the moment in is a kind of conflict between old-style materialism and, and, and a kind of animism or panpsychism struggling to get out. And so far it's only got as far as atoms and molecules. Um, but one reason I like to ask panpsychists about the consciousness of the sun is that I think they're on a slippery slope um, and I'd like to push them down it a bit faster than they go on their own and uh, discussing the consciousness of the sun is a very good way of accelerating this slide down the slippery slope into a full-blown animism. It seems to me like there's a... What, what's, what, what's the basic definition of consciousness then? What, what is this thing that that materialists and animists will uh, are kind of scrapping over? Well, I mean, there's hundreds of definitions, but it's to do with awareness, 
Um, and as I said, to start with possibility, I, that's my own definition, it's about a realm of possibility. Um, they would say it's about perception, awareness, um, algorithms in the brain, you know, as soon as you get into modern cognitive neuroscience, then um, the brain is a computer, consciousness is just the software programs running it. But they, of course, needn't be conscious. In fact, they're not conscious. Um, so, in the materialist philosophy of mind, consciousness is either a, an epiphenomenon that does nothing, like a kind of shadow of physical activity in the brain that has no role, and there's no free will, it doesn't actually do anything. That's the majority view. Or else, it's an illusion produced by brains, um, because it might have some conceivable evolutionary advantage, but it still doesn't do anything. The problem is that to call consciousness an illusion doesn't explain it, it presupposes it, because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. So philosophers of mind in the materialist school go round and round in circles, like dogs chasing their tails, trying to explain it, never succeed. And any one of them comes up with a theory, another one will point out the flaws, and they come up with their own, and the other one will point out the flaws in it. Um, and that's why it's called, the very existence of consciousness is called the hard problem. It seems to me one a major part of that is just the limitations of language, of a word, to adequately describe the phenomenon, in a way. I, it, 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 the, it, this, it's, the hard problem is, well, will show many things, but one of it is just how limited English or language is to describe stuff. I don't think the problem of consciousness is a problem of language. I mean, language itself, of course, is a product of consciousness. Um, and language is inadequate to explain many things, including the ultimate nature of reality, the beginning of the universe, and so forth. Um, but I, I don't think the problem is with language. I think the problem is with worldviews. And do you have a worldview that's essentially an atheist, materialist worldview? There is no God, there is no consciousness out there, the universe is unconscious, it's purposeless, meaningless, um, everything's happened by chance or accident, the laws of nature have no particular reason to be one way or the other, we just live in a universe where they happen to be right for us. Uh, evolution is a matter of blind chance mutations and blind natural selection. That's a world view. Um, that says that consciousness has just emerged in our brains and doesn't actually do anything, also that we don't have free will. A deeply depressing world view, and I think that when you have whole societies based on it like ours, what you'd predict is that lots of people would suffer from depression, and the facts actually bear that out. Um, if you think you live in a meaningless world where your mind is just in your brain and is nothing more than what's happening inside your head, not truly related to anything else deeply depressing. Whereas if you think that consciousness is primary, that we live in a universe that's purposeful, that our minds are part of something much greater than ourselves, that mystical experiences connect us with greater minds than our own, they're not just serotonin levels changing inside our brains, um, then you have a completely different view of the universe. It's not just a matter of language. <laughs>